Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows, special edition with me, Bob Wilson, and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our friend Ken Mansfield is back, and we're glad to have him as we remember Mal Evans. It was 43 years ago today. So we welcome him, and we just want to remember our sponsor before we get started. Beatles Magazine is a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News is updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional materials, and more. So follow the Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day, 8 days a week. Welcome, Ken. Hello, Ken. How you doing? And welcome back to the show. And can you please tell the listeners who Mal Evans is? I'm sure that they know his name, but they probably don't know uh, what he did day in and day out for them and how far back they went and how much he meant to you. So start wherever you like, but could you please tell us about Mal? Well, uh, as most of your listeners know, Mal was there with them from the very beginning. Uh, I don't think anybody could go further back with the Beatles as the Beatles, as the four guys, are, you know. Uh, and Mal was uh, such a part of them that to even think about the Beatles and not have a vision of Mal being a part of that is just... Uh, for those of us who worked with them and knew them, and uh, Mal was always there. Mal was there for whatever is needed, whether it was everything from having a good time or he would have stood in front of him to stop a bullet if he had to. And Mal was everything for all things, uh, never more than a heartbeat away. And for me, he was probably one of the most special people I ever met in my life and a friendship uh, that was deeper than I've ever had with any other uh, man or person, I think. Mal was just special. Um, the day we met, uh, something just clicked. And the thing about Mal for me was, is I'd already been brought aboard by the Beatles to run the company in America. And so they already had a trust in me and a belief in me. But Mal, the fact that Mal trusted me and Mal, you know, just knew I was okay and I was good for them. Him speaking his feelings in the band just made me just at so at home and them so comfortable with with, uh, with me and, and me with them. So uh, for me, uh, I would never really, if there was something I really needed to talk to them about and I wasn't sure I was on firm footing, I could always run things by mouth first, you know. And it was a twinkling of, of an eye with him. He, uh, didn't take him long. He knew the guys that well. And uh, so he was just a special person. We called him the gentle giant. Uh, everybody that knew Mal, loved Mal. You know, I just posted something on Facebook about uh, the fact that this was uh, uh, the day that Mal died 43 years ago. And the outpouring that came in was I've never seen so many people react in such a loving and, and uh, just positive way about whoever you know, Mal's life or Mal had touched on their lives was just special. And uh, he, for me, was uh, there. I don't know if people said there was a fifth Beatle. I think uh, he was, uh, there were five people uh, in that number four Beatles, I guess, because uh, Mal was so deeply embedded in their lives and, and those of us that had worked with him in our lives. You refer to him as the gentle giant, and I've heard, I think, George call him Big Mal. For those of us yeah. who never, you know, never stood next to him, how big of a fellow was he? You know, I don't know. I was, um, I would say he was probably six four, uh, and I, I can't. He was just a big guy. He was a big guy uh, in every respect. I think that's what made his bigness bigger. I, I, I told you a story once before when I was on a tour with Mal and Jackie Lomax. We were in Cleveland. And again, of course, when Mal was road managing a, a Beatle act, an Apple act, uh, his attitude was he was still you know, on the road with the Beatles. He, he treated everybody like that. And when we went on the road together, Mal set me in place, let me know what the situation was when we went out with uh, this, at this particular point was George's. Uh, you know, project with Jackie Lomax. And um, <laughs> one night in Cleveland, uh, we were at a club afterwards, real late at night, and some guy walked up and got in uh, Jackie's face and started just really tearing into Jackie. And 
Mal turned around. I'm sitting there. We're at a table. And Mal turned around and stood up. And it's almost like a blowfish, I guess, how they can just puff up and make themselves twice as big. Mal unfolded his entire body and his entire demeanor and just hovered over this guy and let out the biggest roar in his face. And I don't know, the guy either dis- disappeared or disintegrated. And, uh, I mean, it was so fearful from this very gentle man. And when the guy disappeared, uh, about 10 seconds later, Mal just turned and looked at Jackie and with a look said, okay, Jackie, it's okay now. <laughs> you know, Mal's here. And that's the way I think we all felt about Mal. Not in a having to take care of us physically, but he could just, it was just his nature to be a good friend and a, and a good associate and a guy you want to have always by on your side. Well, he sounds like a great protector with a great heart. So, Warren, do you want to carry yeah. on? I can do that, and thank you, Bulldog. Do you have any uh, stories that stand out in your mind uh, about Mal? You know, when I think back on Mal, uh, the one thing that will always remain, and this is a perfect follow-up to what I was just talking about, Mal, because it made him sound like a pretty big, tough guy, but uh, Mal uh, told me one time, he said, uh, I wish I could imitate Mal. I used to be able to imitate him better because he had this big, rich voice. He said, you know, Ken, he said, uh, I'm just so full of love. He said, I don't know what to do with all of it. <laughs> and that was kind of the thing. Uh, uh, that was just Mal. He just was this loving person. And uh, But, you know, if he had a job to do, he's extremely loyal to the Beatles. But uh, that's something that, that always really stuck with me, is just that that uh, feeling he had of just, you know, love and care for his compatriots and his friends and the people that were close to him. If you look at uh, Mal, he looks like that type of person, like a person that you can get along with very well and uh, a nice personality, that's for sure. Uh, Can you tell us about the circumstances of losing Mal? Uh, Yeah, Um, and I write about Mal. I I devote a whole chapter to him uh, at the end of my book. Uh, And... uh, That night, Mal had, uh, things were kind of going pretty rough for Mal in L.A. for a while. He just, uh, you know, he's used to so many things just falling in place because of being with the Beatles. And uh, he was just coming up against the hard realities of the, of the uh, you know, L.A. music business. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was really struggling. And, and so I was getting ready to, I was producing uh, Jesse Colt at the time. And I had a number one hit record called... Uh, uh, I'm not Lisa, and it was up. Uh, Jesse was up for Artist of the Year, the Artist of the Year, because that record. And I was, I was getting ready to go to the uh, Billboard Awards show. I think it might have been one of the first Billboard Awards shows they had. In case she won, because she was on the road, I was going to accept for her. And so Mal calls me, and I said, "Hey, Mal." And he said, uh, "Hi." I said, "You okay?" He said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm okay." And I said, "Well." Uh, uh, you sure, Mel? Something, something. You, are you sure you're okay? And he said, yeah, I'm okay. Uh, Paul just agreed he was going to give me credit on this, and Atlantic Records is, you know, going to uh, give me a produce, producing deal or something like that. And I said, Mel, what's wrong? He said, Oh, oh, nothing. And he said, uh, uh, something else, you know, that just happened good. And I, and I just knew Mel too well. And I said, Mel, something's wrong. I'm getting ready to be picked up here in a minute to go to this award show. Uh, can we get together later tonight? And he said, well, no. And I said, okay, tomorrow, lunch tomorrow, okay. How about, how about 1 o'clock at Musso Franks down in Hollywood Boy? I said, okay. And I hung up the phone. Now I'm going to the uh, award show, and uh, Flip Wilson was the MC. And so I'm standing there, and Whip, Whip Wilson said, and the country female artist, new country artist of the year is Jesse Colder and accepting is about when he's just about when he's saying that Diane, uh, I forget her name. She was a writer for Hollywood uh, reporter or one of those magazines said, touched me and said, Ken, I'm sorry about Mal. And I said, well, what do you mean? And the guy says, hey, here's Ken Mansell to accept the award. And so I walk up on stage and I'm like in, what, what is she when what happened to Mal? And it was like, I was in a dream. I could see, I could see his lips moving and him saying something and, handing me the award and I I take the award and I say something and I come right back down the stage. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, he was 
shot uh, tonight. And uh, uh, I mean, I was just stunned, and I had no idea what had happened. And I found out later that you know he how he had been killed uh, by the police, and uh, and then Harry filled me in later because, because Harry, uh, you know, kind of took it. Harry Nielsen kind of took it from there, but that night was so so unusual because it's like well i should have said felt guilty because i do i wasn't there and i knew he, he i knew something was happening but i know mal would never blame me i just knew mal he would have never said oh you let me down man or you know or something like that i just knew mal uh i just know how he was and so i really didn't couldn't feel guilty but i, I sure felt bad that i couldn't have been there at that moment uh, I would have dropped everything for him, as he as he would have done for me, I think, at the time. But uh, a very very touching moment, very personal. I just talked to him a little bit while before that, and knew he was really reaching out. I don't know if anybody else he called before it happened, but um, yeah, a very special person, and obviously a very uh, meaningful time in his life. The night he died. Right. Uh, I can really hear the emotion in your voice, Ken, and um, it is uh, getting to my heart also right now, and um, I do feel bad about that very much, and you're welcome to go on about it and say what you want. Um, After you get done here, I'm going to hand it off to the bulldog. You got my emotions going right now, uh, Ken. Well, my, so. mine too. Mine too. Uh, I, I got you. Know, I, I, I've written about now. Uh, I expl- I explain all this in 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 the roof and stuff, but uh, just there was something about him that kind of sha- overshadowed everybody else I ever never, that I ever knew. And uh, um, today is the 43rd anniversary, and that's why I'm talking today. Uh, just because, just out of respect, and to uh, pay my homage to me, to him in this way. Um, I was, I can't rem- I was talking to you guys earlier. I can't remember if we were recording that or not. But uh, you know, when, when I was brought aboard at Apple, it was pretty incredible that the Beatles uh, felt that they trusted me enough and felt believed in me enough to to uh, bring me in and make me the a U.S. manager of Apple Records to run their label in America. But when I got to London and uh, met Mal, uh, things happened between him and I. It was just a friendship that started from day one. Like we just hit the ground running as a friend's friends and a friendship that just deepened. And Mal trusted me and Mal believed in me and his and he was very uh, vocal about that with the guys i think and i think that that's one of the reasons that i've really felt i was brought in i was part of the team and that uh they trusted me and and uh both males made me comfortable with them and uh you know and made them comfortable with me and uh because of uh, mal's relationship with them if i was going to touch on a subject that i felt was Maybe I, I better be careful where I'm treading here. Now I could always run things by Mal, and he'd know he'd know instantly how to guide me, you know, within the framework so that I wouldn't mess up. You know, I had four bosses, and so it was, you're always kind of walking a, a tightrope, it seems. But uh, Mal was always there, and we had a long life uh, afterwards. Well, long it wasn't that many years, but because when he came to L.A. and the Beatles broke up and stuff, then we were part of a a gang that ran together there with, you know, Harry Nielsen and, and Ringo and some of the other people that come over from Apple to America. Mm. Um, what was your, what was the relationship like between Mal? I know that you came in later in the game, but you know, I'm sure you must have known. How did he meet them originally? They all came from the same neighborhoods. He was friends with maybe one or two of them and he was brought well, in. I, I, I think he was a telephone lineman uh, back in those days. And I think he ended up maybe like a lot of people when they start with a band, just maybe we saw him at a club and became, now there's guys, there's people that know all these details. I was reading some of them today, uh, but uh, he was just happened to be there at the beginning and just uh, believed in him enough that he was willing to, to be their friend and, and work for them with, you know, without money and without 
uh, anything. Just he just loved what he's doing. He loved them, and they, you know, loved him. So it was something that was so. I think that's what made his relationship so good with the Beatles, because they trusted them beginning, and they were very loyal to two old friendships. And I think Mel uh, really had already made his bones with the Beatles just by the way he started out with them, and just uh, you know, just an honest friendship and an honest belief in in their talent. Now, as far as they go, can you can you clue us in? You know what his relationship was like with each Beatle or whichever Beatle comes to mind. Um, he knew them way back in the beginning; they were very close. But by the time you joined up at Apple. Um, what did you notice about his his personal relationships with the Beatles? Well, um, like I've said, uh, he was never more than 30 feet or 30 seconds away from any one of them. All of them or one of them at any time. He just, there was always, he had this sense about them. I never saw any favoritism. I don't think, uh, you know, there's four distinct personalities there. And I don't think he had to uh, deal with each personality thinking like that. He was just a part of their mentality and a, and a part of their being at that time. So I never, no, I never saw, maybe I spent more time with Mel, with George, uh, probably with George and then with Ringo. Yeah. But uh, I don't think there was uh, <laughs> like I used to uh, tell, tell Ringo that, uh, that, you know, people would say, Hey, Mother liked you best, you know, a bunch of siblings. I always say, Ringo, you know, well, I always liked you best, just like with a wink. And I don't think uh, there was anything about him liking any of them better or, or you know, them one of them liking him more. And uh, I know John was with him, helped him during the end. I know they all, they all did. The, the friendship was so deep. Mal just wanted to make his, you know, make his own way on his own, not just be known just as a Beatles, but, you know, he had a pretty good ear for things. He had a pretty good talent for things. And, uh, I mean, a guy that could maybe decide to uh, bring the band called, um, well, they were called the, uh, uh, <laughs> bad thing, they were called the Ivies before, you know. Um, and Mal just, uh, uh, he was just part of them. That's the only way I can see. That's how I always saw it, always felt it. If, if I can ask sort of a sensitive question, this business to me seems that, you know, from an outsider looking in, um, it seems when you're on the top of the world, you're on the top of the world. But if a few things go wrong and you're not on the top of the world, it can be beyond cold. And um, I was just wondering, because, you know, I hear the emotion you're expressing and how much you loved him. Um, I was just wondering what things got, like if I can ask, um, what things had gotten to him. Like you said, the the industry became harsh. You know, this was a guy who was with the Beatles uh, four years earlier. They were still together. So, like, what happened so quickly? Well, it wasn't quickly. It was a long period of uh, things just not panning out. Uh, deals he was supposed to be getting, uh, projects he was supposed to be getting. Uh, I think maybe uh, even some of the things he expected from the guys' credits that he didn't get. Uh, I think he felt all of a sudden he was out alone all by himself on this island in America. And even though, you know, they were in and out and they were part of things, I just, uh, Mal was just constantly frustrated. Um, he felt, he felt he had the abilities. He felt he had the background. And I think in some ways the Beatle association was so tight that Mal was having, and this is my, my feeling that Mal was having trouble really getting his own identity, you know, aside from that. And I'll tell you something, uh, no matter who you've worked with, when you end up working with the Beatles, you're, you're one of the Beatles guys, you know, that was just because nothing could top that. And for Mal being that, that band was so stratospheric. Uh, nobody else just was anything like that. There's, there's no second place band in my mind. And to come from such a high, atmosphere in the music business down to really being a guy on the street you know like we all all made our bones on the street one way or another whether it's just uh trying to convince a record label of our ideas whatever we called it being on the street um and for mel it was a rather extreme thing you know I, i've written before in my books that, uh, you wouldn't notice if you start out i said i grew up in idaho 
And I started out poor, and if I stayed poor my whole life, I'd have never thought of anything about being poor. But when you've been up real high, and then something happens, your your life turns around, and you end up not doing so well. You really notice the difference. <laughs> you know, it's it's rather extreme. So I think you know, for Mal, I think he really uh, kind of missed the good old days in a way. But I'm just conjecturing conjecturing now. But this question might be hard to answer, but I'm just wondering, like, if you've been with the band that long, like since you know the early '60s. Um, and, you know, the band breaks up. The band has, you know, written songs and has a back catalog to sell. It's still popular. When you come out of that, do you own anything? Have you been, you know, in a sense, given any stock or anything? Or are you now you're just starting from scratch? It reminds me sort of of Elvis's bodyguards. Like when they stopped being his bodyguards, they really, some of them had nothing else to do. I was just yeah. trying to picture what that must feel like when the Beatles broke up. He didn't really yeah. own a part of the corporation, even though you were there so long. So it must be yeah. a very good feeling, you know. Well, there was there was a part of that in there. I think that's why, in some cases, uh, one of the dissertations I read about, he had something he had worked on or had an idea that they, you know, did or something. If he had just gotten credit for it, credit for it, it would have been uh, a lot of money to him, and and he was not paid well. He was not paid well at all. Uh, in, today, in today's uh, standards, to be the what he was with them, and uh, I don't know. I just uh, I think there was there's a lot of things like that for Mal, and a lot of things just piled up, you know, for him. And you know, he's a sensitive guy, and so sensitive guys tend to uh, react to things more, more deeply. I think, you know, and I loved it when uh, during this time. Uh, I just uh, had gone through a divorce and I still had my house up in the Hollywood Hills with a pool and everything. And Mal and Lil, his wife and the kids would come over and stay in the, in the house up there. And just to see uh, uh, this big old guy, you know, loving on his kids and then swimming in the pool all day and just, uh, and just being part of that little family in a way, just for a while, just to see that side of him, you know, without all the crazy people around, just, uh, that part of him. So I think these are the things. And then when being on the road with uh, he and Jackie, because uh, Jackie Lomax, because we really uh, were out there. We were doing something really important. George was uh, calling every day just to make sure you know everything was going well with his artist and uh, just sharing in that. Uh, I wasn't we're really learning. You know, I've been on on the road for a while, but I really learned from that. We're just like really be a class road manager and just how a road manager that took care of your band, took care of every, every thing. Mel, uh, Jackie never left his room until the limo was waiting and the door was open before he, Mal would even have him come out of his room because he wouldn't have Jackie hanging around, you know, in the hallways waiting to get to, to a, or anything like that. Mal just took care of everything. Um, and I'm not sure where <laughs> where that's come. That was just having flashbacks of, of time, uh, you know, with him. I know the last time we spoke, you had talked about when you went to Nashville, and even though you were the American VP of Apple, you also found yourself in a bit of a spot. I was wondering what you relied on to pull yourself out, like what touched your life and helped you get through that time. Uh, uh Perseverance, I guess. I just uh, kept plugging away and uh, eventually, you know, pulled off a, a, a record that that made it. And uh, uh, I think I was just hanging in there. I think after a while, anybody that's in the business long enough, you know, started out trying to break through and then broke through and then fell down again and stuff like that. You become uh, you become pretty much uh, weathered and pretty. Uh, uh, it's just a business. It's a business, and as soon as you understand it's a business like no other business, uh, you're not going to change the business. You know the business is changing you, and uh, so there it is. If you're not, if you don't like the business, then you know go do something else. Don't complain about it. There's you know, and especially when when you're happening and other other the other people aren't, then you know. Uh, they're they're just as upset as <laughs> you are now when you're when you're starting to fall apart, and so that's just a, a vague answer. But yeah, that was a, that's a whole different story. So, 
touched on this a little uh, earlier about when and where and how you found out about Mal Evans' death. Um, exactly what was the story that was reported in the news and the newspapers about Mal? I've heard so many different versions of that, and uh, I just, after a while, I, I don't know. People keep asking me what, what actually happened. I don't know what actually happened. I know the time frame. I know that Mal was most. I've heard uh, different versions of what happened that night. Uh, some of them pretty extreme. Some of them, uh, you know, made Mal look bad. Others made the police look bad. And because once again, it's a hard thing when you're doing interviews and talk about somebody and some things. If you weren't there, you're always kind of at a disadvantage. And uh, and that making that point is why uh, for listeners reading the books by the people who were there with the Beatles uh, is really uh, a way to kind of piece things together because you'll start seeing consistency in what a Jeff Emmerich would say and, and uh, you know, what somebody else might say. Uh, you're starting to see consistencies, but the people... Now, this is not leave out the researchers and the people that's been the hard work of putting these things together because without them... Uh, I wouldn't know a lot about the Beatles because uh, they tie things together for me. Oh, yeah, I was there when this happened. So that's what that was about, you know. So everybody's important. But um, uh, that then I, I just, it's just too sensitive for me even to try and say, well, here's what happened because I don't know. I wasn't there. Right. So, <laughs> well, okay. I, I understand. And uh, this. This show is very emotional for me, and I, as I'm sure it is for you, I can yeah. hear it in your tone of your voice, and I can hear it's coming straight from your heart, and I appreciate that. Um, can you Thank please you, tell us about your works, and um, is Mal Evans featured in any of them? Uh, perhaps the fans would especially like to read it at this time. I would say uh, there's two books. I'm 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 an author now, and that's I made that transition over time from the music business to be an author. So uh, if you go to mainmansfield.com, that's M-A-I-N-M-A-N-S-F-I-E-L-D.com, I have the seven books there. Um, Mal, I would say the two books because I, I I addressed this thing the night we're talking about in. Almost, uh, in fact, I even repeated some of it because it was hard to touch on it. It was hard for me to write it mm -hmm. and uh, to really write it. But uh, in the Beatles Bible in Bodega Bay, which is a uh, book that's designed for both the hardcore rock and roll Beatle fans and uh, the spiritual, the Christian people, could find uh, great you know things in there. And then the roof is where uh, I close off with Mal once again in the book. So those are the two places, the two books would be the best ones to get there. And then the, the other books, um, Mal's in, <laughs> if maybe not totally, he's spirit, uh, in the spirit, he's with, in a lot of my books because he had a lot to do with shaping how I think about books. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, that's it. And uh, okay. I, I, I miss him. And um, as we all do, the people we truly care about, they are very important part of our lives. And Mal was a very important part of mine. And so, all right. I, I thank you okay. for that um, very much. And it, I can tell it's coming from your heart. And, yes. and you care very much about the man. Okay. Um, yep. I appreciate all that. And um, I thank you for coming on the show once again. Um, you are a great guest, and I'm happy to have you on any time you would like. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always a learning experience for me, and um, I do appreciate everything you do for us. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Just my deep condolences, prayers, and um, comfort. And I'm sorry you're feeling bad today, but I'm glad you knew someone who was such a good friend to you. And thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. And I hope we've been able to give you some comfort. And uh, I hope the good times remain high in your heart. 
remembering him, and our, uh, our love goes out to you.